What's up, Wizards? It's Dev, a.k.a. the Uwu Guru from SVMCG. We like that magic stuff. And you know what? Magic is one of those games that requires you to have a diverse skill set if you're going to be truly successful. Now, I've been playing for over a quarter of a century at this point, and all that time, I've met lots of different kinds of magic players, and I imagine you have too, no matter how long you've been playing. People who had academic understandings of concepts like card advantage, but not so good at managing board states when they start getting out of control. I've known people who are incredibly talented at analyzing metas, but not necessarily good at making clutch plays when it comes down to it. And probably the most common distinction between skill sets of magic players is I've known lots and lots of players who are really really good at playing magic on a fundamental level, but not quite as good when it came to actually building the decks. Now, myself, I feel like I'm kind of the opposite of that last example. In case you haven't seen some of the Twitch streams or the gameplays that I put on the channel, it's pretty apparent that I am not, even after 25 years, the best magic player in the world. But that's okay. I've always been confident that my true ability as a player lies in the ability to make a good magic deck. And that's why I made this channel in the first place so long ago now. But in all the time I've been on YouTube, almost six years at this point, I still haven't just made a basic deck building concepts video. And now I think it's time to change that. Over the years, I've read and seen literally thousands at this point of different articles and YouTube videos on this subject, but I have gripes with a lot of them, right? They're either no-brainer tips for absolute beginner babies, like don't put 130 cards in your deck, and in case you need to hear that, don't put 130 cards in your deck. You want as high a chance as possible of drawing the best cards in your deck? Yeah, right? So keep it to the minimum whenever possible. Free tip for you, kid. But in any case, sometimes they're just not comprehensive enough. These articles, they'll say things like, oh, remember that mana curve is a thing, but they don't really go into the specifics of mana curve. That always bothers me. So today, I'm going to try to address some of the problems I have with other sources <laughs> in, under this umbrella and uh, really try to get as, as comprehensive as possible in talking about six different common deck building mistakes that people make and how to fix them. So we're going to go ahead and jump into it, but just last quick thing, and I mean super quick, like the video, subscribe if you haven't done it yet. If you enjoy the content that you're seeing, it would mean a lot to me if I had your subscription. Even if you're not the kind of person that subscribes to YouTube channels, I'd really be needing some subscribers though. So hit the subscribe button and the bell for the notifications, and it would really help you do that. But let's go ahead and actually jump into it here with the first tip of the video, and this is easily the most common reoccurring theme that I see in decks that people send me and deck lists on the internet that people want improved generally. And that is not enough interaction. This is extremely common. Now, this can just mean not enough removal in your deck, but that's just a really basic understanding of it. A really easy example of this is a clerics deck that I continue to get in my inbox. I think I've seen it four times already this season, and it often looks a little bit like this. Completely all in on cleric synergy with no regard to the fact that your opponent also gets to play magic. You can have all the cleric synergy that you want and do some cool things and even pick up some games sometimes with a deck like this. But for the most part, when your opponent plunks down that Ember Cleave, that Great Hinge, that Genesis Ultimatum, that Ugin that they've been working towards, it really doesn't matter what you've done. You just start wishing you had something to deal with what they have. In most cases, a deck like this will work much better in practice. Well, just adding minimal interactive elements, things like a Blood Chief's Thirst, an Eliminate, a Heartless Act, or even an Elspeth Conquer's Death, here and there will make you much happier that you decided to cut some of the cleric synergy in order to add some way of interacting with your opponent's decisions. But often the best, and in a lot of cases the most sophisticated way, to make sure you get that interaction into your deck is to incorporate it into your synergy in the first place. A lot of the best decks in standard do this right now. I just mentioned Yorion a second ago, and whether you like Esper Yorion or Mardu Yorion or any flavor of this deck, they all kind of basically do the same thing, right? They play removal elements like Glass Casket, Skyclave Apparition, Elspeth Conquers Death that, yeah, are interaction, but they're also synergy with what the deck is trying to do. You can blink any of these with a Yorion and get a double shot of removal. That's why the Mardu deck plays Omen of the Forge, for instance. It's because it can take out two small creatures when you need it to, or sometimes just go to the face a couple of times. That is diversity while also maintaining interaction and synergy all at the same time. Again, a lot of really good decks do this. Another good example is the Mono White Maul of the Skyclaves deck right now that's mostly looking to hit a Seasoned Hallowblade on turn two and then hit a Maul of Sky Skyclaves, rather, 
excuse me, on turn three, and just ride that for the entire game. But this deck does a lot of really interesting stuff. It plays Kabira Takedown, as well as Skyclave Apparition and Glass Casket, along with Shepherd of the Flock, which allows it to bring stuff like Kabira Takedown, if you played it as a land, back to your hand. You can bring Skyclave Apparition back to your hand and get something else with it. So again, this is basically a white weenie deck that plays stuff like Apparition and Giant Killer and stuff that are creatures that are also removal elements. An aggro deck needs to play creatures, but an aggro deck also needs removal. So this deck ends up playing something like 14 different removal spells without really sacrificing too many slots for creatures because it still plays creatures, it still plays lands, but it also gets to play removal in those same slots. It's an ingenious way of going about things, and some of the best decks of all time do this. But on to number two here, and it's kind of the inverse of number one, right? You need to have enough threats in your deck to actually win a game of Magic. Another really common deck that I've gotten in my inbox for the last couple of years now is some take or another on a deck like this, whether it's Orzov or Mardu or whatever. I see decks all the time that have 30 some odd removal pieces in them and no real way to win the game, right? In this deck, what do we have? Masker Worm, Amiria's Call, and Murderous Rider. That's about it, right? You could work Crawling Barons in the, into the land base if you wanted to, but you know, what do you do if your opponent counters your Masker Worm or hits Shatter the Sky after you cast Amiria's Call or plays a 3-3 after you play Murderous Rider. I mean, what are you going to do? It really helps to have as much dimension as possible. And just like the last tip, it's entirely possible to add threats to your deck that are also interactive elements. I think a good example of this in the current standard, at least, is the Croxa decks, which appear to be just a pile of removal. A lot of these decks have 20 pieces of removal. After you count up all the red removal spells and the black removal spells, it's just a lot. But but there are reasons for that. They not only need to fill their graveyard so that they can actually escape that Croxa, but they also need to fill their graveyard for cards like, say, Magmatic Chandler. But that doesn't stop there. A lot of these decks will also play at least the one copy of Crawling Barons. They'll play something else that has escape. They'll play Timurit Calls the Dead. They'll play Mire Trident and Agadim's Awakening to get those creatures back from the graveyard because they may as well play Agadim's Awakening. Why not? A lot of these Croxa decks will also play a couple of copies of Rankle, which again is kind of a removal piece while also being a hasty, evasive, relatively big bodied threat. So I really like the way the Croxa deck not only has defensive elements, you know, Croxa can sometimes make them, well, always makes them discard a card if they have any in their hand, but it's also this enormous recursive threat that the opponent often, often has to deal with multiple times over the span of the game, or they're forced to have some sort of, you know, exile effect for it. But at the same time, your opponent also has the headache of dealing with Rankles and Crawling Barons, Magmatic Channelers, Burn Spells and whatnot, Bone Crusher Giants. Uh, you know, it's not just the kind of deck that plays 20 removal spells and calls it a day. I guess I'll just mill my opponent to death or something. <laughs> you know, maybe I'll just hit this one Crox of the one time and it's guaranteed to live. That just isn't the case in a lot of games of Magic. You need to play enough threats to feasibly actually win or close a game. That's another problem a lot of decks have, right? You'll be able to control your opponent's board state. You hit that Shatter the Sky and you've still got a Heartless Act in your hand for anything they might do. The problem is they keep turn by turn, drawing cards, and you don't draw any way of closing the game before they're able to reestablish a board state. Again, these control type decks are often dependent on controlling the board state and turning the corner, but if you don't have any wheels on a card, you can't turn that corner. Some of the most successful magic decks of all time in any format are decks that have multiple game plans, multiple paths to victory. Plan A, if that doesn't succeed, we always have plan B. If that doesn't succeed, we always have plan C. And if you're just stuck on plan A and that's all your deck is doing, this combo, this creature, this aura, whatever, then you're going to have a bad time a lot of the time. Now, numbers three and four. I assume are probably going to take up a large body of this video because I have a lot to say for numbers three and four. Uh, and we'll get started with number three, which is mana base issues. Not just land count, but also how many sources of each color you need in a deck. And I want to stress that there are, just like we'll get to at number four, there are no hard and fast rules in this arena, if you'll pardon the pun, but there are definitely some guidelines. This is, again, where a lot of articles and other sources tick me off a little bit because they'll just be like, start with 24 lands, and they don't really, they don't really expand past that. Now, way back in the day, we were dumb. A lot of Magic players that I knew in, like, 96 and 97 would just play 
20 lands. In an in attempt to get to Shivan Dragon on turn six <laughs> with just 20 lands in their deck. And if you're playing red, black, baby, 10 swamps, 10 mountains. That's all you need. That's a dump. That doesn't work. It does not work. It turns out that the 24 land baseline is a good place to start, but you also, you've got to expand on it beyond that. And we're going to try to do that a little bit here. Now, a piece of advice that's always stuck with me is what, I've, what I'm going to start calling the Nelson Principle. I've brought it up a couple of times on the channel in the past, but in case you've never heard this, I once heard Brad Nelson say that if you're looking to make your deck better, sometimes what you need to do is cut a card and add a land, and you'll be very surprised by the results a lot of the time. Mana Screw is one of the worst things that can happen in a game of, ma of Magic. Now, Mana Flood is also really bad. You don't want to have too many lands in your deck, don't get me wrong, but then at least you can cast all the spells that you do draw. It's terrible. I mean, I've said this before, but one of the worst things about Magic as a game is its resource management system vis-a-vis -vis the lands. I don't really care for the land system, but that's a whole other topic for a whole other video. We have to deal with this in what is ostensibly the best game of all time, <laughs> by, by my account at least. It's just a system that we have to deal with. And honestly, I get so many decks in my Deck Doctor inbox that need two, three, or even four more lands. In this day and age, it's not uncommon still to see decks that play 20, 21 lands, but often these are decks that are mostly made up of one drops, right? Every now and again, you'll see a red deck or a white deck or very rarely a black deck that'll play 20 to 24 one drops. And those can get away with anywhere between 18 and 20 lands a lot of the time. And hey, on Arena, we've all seen the 13, 14 land experiments. I've done a 12 land experiment on Arena and those games worked out pretty well for me. So that's a whole, again, a whole other ball of wax. But in terms of conventional magic, you want anywhere between 18 to 21 lands in a deck that has this many one drops. But this is just about the only kind of deck that you're going to want that few lands in. In the modern day, a lot of ramp decks will play 26 lands at the very least, and a lot of control decks will play 27, even 28 lands. In the last season, when we had Gross Spiral and Euro demanding that we, you know, have as many lands as possible to get the full value off of both of those cards, it was not uncommon to see people play 29 or even 30 lands in their deck. Oh, by the way, I also forgot Arboreal Grazer, another card that wants you to play a bunch of lands. So it was not uncommon to see literally half the deck be lands, but... Even nowadays, when we Euros ban, Gross Spirals out of the format, Arboreal Grazers out of the format, even now, it's still fairly wise to play 27 lands in your control deck and MDFCs, the modal flip cards, make that easier than ever. As a matter of fact, even in small ball aggro decks, MDFCs make it possible to play a lot more lands than you normally would. For instance, this is the Mono Red deck that I sometimes grind to get my rank up as quickly as possible. <laughs> when I'm in, you know, gold or platinum at the beginning of the season, I'm trying to get to diamond. I will often play this mono red deck to get as many quick games in as possible. And this deck plays 25 lands when you count the MDFCs. And it's a deck that doesn't really go very high on the curve. It doesn't go before above four. So you never want Embercleave to cost more than four. So I, ca I count that as a four drop along with Torbrand. But in any case, this deck still plays 25 lands and it's ostensibly a really fast aggro deck. So in this day and age, you can get away with adding lands to your deck more than you ever have. And often it's the most <laughs> prudent thing to do in a lot of the decks that I get. You know, I get decks that look very mechanically sound in terms of the main deck card choices. And I get to the mana base and it's 17 cards or it's 21 lands in a deck that wants to run four six drops, and that's just not gonna work, Chief. But onto the subject of how many different sources of each color to have in your deck, it really depends on what you wanna cast on what turn of the game. Now, a lot of what I'm gonna say here comes from the work of Frank Karsten, in case you haven't heard of them, the preeminent mathematician in the field of MTG studies at the moment. Um, he has published multiple articles over the years that include tables uh, that basically state, you know, if you're playing this card or a card with this casting cost, you want this many sources in your deck uh, to have this mathematical chance of being able to play that card on the turn that you want to play it. Now, again, these aren't hard and fast rules, but these are guidelines that have become more or less accepted over the years uh, because all of these numbers are going to give you something like a 91% chance, a 9 out of 10 chance, uh, a better than 9 out of 10 chance of playing a given card on whatever turn you want to play it. So, for instance, if I want a one drop on turn one of a specific color, say I want Edge Wall Innkeeper in my deck and I want to get it on turn one. Well, best way to do that is to include 14 untapped 
green sources in my deck for turn one. That gives us close to a 92% chance of being able to actually play Edgewall Innkeeper on turn one. Now, if you've played XCOM or Valkyria Chronicles or pretty much any RTS in your entire life, you know that 92% is not perfect, and that 8% means a great deal. You will miss some of the time, but that gives you statistically one of the greatest chances possible to play Edgewall Innkeeper while still being able to play other colors of mana in your deck. Skyclave Apparition, for instance. Two white mana. It's casting cost, but it's a three drop. Any spell like this, you want 18 sources of that color in your deck. If you want to reliably cast that card on turn three, and you put cards in your deck, because often you want to reliably cast them on a given turn. So if you really want to make sure that you have Murderous Rider up on turn three, ready to cast, 18 black sources is what you need to hit. Let's say you want to play a four drop with two different colors in its casting cost, or two of the same color rather. Like say you want to play four drop Teferi. That's in standard right now. Well, you need to work 16 different blue sources into your deck. And the final example I'll use for this, although I will refer you to the link in the description, I'll link Karsten's latest article with these numbers in it. So you can look over for yourself. These are very important articles for just basic mana base theory. But I guess the final example is, let's say you want a five drop with two of the same color in it. Like I want to play Vivian in standard right now. Well, I better work 14 green sources into my deck if that's what I want to do. But of course, if I want to play Questing Beast on turn four before the Vivian, again, I need to work 16 green sources into the deck to make sure I can reliably pull that off. I guess one more example is cards like Underworld Dreams or Goblin Chain Whirler. Frank wants you to put 23 lands of that color into your deck. So sometimes these can be really difficult to work into two-color decks. But honestly, again, no hard and fast rules. A lot of people have gone down to 22 to make sure that they hit cards with three of the same color in their casting cost on turn three. So again, these are not rules. These are guidelines. But... Frank Karsten's work is uh, probably more trustable than anything else I'm going to say in this video. So if you're having trouble casting certain spells on certain turns, I refer you to the table in the description. And number four is probably the thing that I am most nervous to talk about, and that is curve theory. If you've been playing Magic for more than a couple of weeks and you've sought out, you know, articles about how to effectively build a deck, uh, you've probably seen the concept of curve. You know, you want to have enough cards in your deck to where you can play the best thing on every turn for at least the first few turns. You want to play a one drop on one, though not all the time, a two drop on two, a three drop on three, a four drop on four, and a five drop on five. The reason for that a lot of the time is because it's better to cast a three drop on turn three than it is to cast a two drop on turn three, because three drops are often better than two drops. So if you cast a two drop on turn three, your opponent casts a three drop, they've often outclassed you. And you're, you're at the beginning of a, of a long and winding road of hurt. So you want to be able to cast the appropriate spell for each turn on the given turn in question. At least, again, earlier in the game. Now, sometimes you can get over this by, say, double spelling. You know, I'll cast a two drop and a one drop on turn two, or on turn three, rather. But often, a three drop will still outshadow those efforts. And you've spent more cards to do that than your opponent spent by playing their 1-3 drop, which will come back to bite you a little later in the game when they still have two cards in their hand and you got zero or one. Now, a lot of people are going to tell you that the average Magic deck plays somewhere around 14 two drops, and that's about right, you know, especially in an aggro deck or a mid-range deck that plays a lot of creatures. 14's right, but even in control decks, because control decks need something to do in the early game. Even ramp decks need something to do in the early game. You'll often see anywhere between 10, 12, or again, even 14, two drops, often in the form of removal, for instance, in your basic control deck. This is the slots that the control deck uses on Eliminates, Heartless Axe, Blood Chief's Thirst, Omen of the Sea, all those kind of cards. Now, one of the ways I like to look at it is that in a lot of decks, I want to play somewhere around 16 one and two drops. You know, decks with Edgewall Innkeeper and Brazen Borrower and Bone Crusher Giant have effectively 12 one and two drops in them. Add in Lovestruck Beast and you've got 16 one and two drop plays in these decks. Some of them will even incorporate a couple of scavenging news or whatever to make sure that they have that 16 number, right? So... I like to look at it more than you want 14 two drops. I think you want 16 one and two drops in your deck. But again, that's just personal preference. One way or the other, you need something to do early in the game. And if you're not around, you know, somewhere between 12 and 16 one and two drops, kind of reevaluate reevaluate and see what you can do in the early turns to make your overall game plan easier to accomplish. 
But moving on, you'll often see 8 to 12, 3 drops, in most Magic decks. I think the magic number for a lot of people is 10. That's why I said 8 to 12, because right in the middle, right smack there, 10, 3 drops, which is very often what you'll see, whether it's a control deck, an aggro deck, a mid-range deck, a combo deck, whatever. Very often, around 10 3 drops is what you're going to see. A lot of non-aggro decks, mid-range decks, control decks, will play somewhere between six or even eight four drops. And it drops off from there, right? You'll sometimes get somewhere around three to five uh, five drops. You know, you'll see two to four or six drops in some control decks and ramp decks especially. Ramp decks will play four seven drops like Genesis Ultimatum. They'll play three or four eight drops like Ugin. So obviously you have to sacrifice a little bit as far in terms of early curve to make sure you can fit those cards into your deck. But by and large, if you're just building an average, you know, mid range or control deck, very often these are the numbers you want to be hitting. You want somewhere between 14 and 16, one and two drop plays, 10 three drop plays, four, six really to eight, four drop plays, and then the rest you can just kind of play around with. Now again, I really want to stress that these are not rules. Absolutely. Magic is a game of creation, especially the deck building aspect of it. So I don't want you to feel like you're boxed into these numbers, but this typically seems to be what works in terms of generating a curve that can, again, allow you to accomplish whatever you want to accomplish later on in the game. You have to, again, like I said way back at the beginning, remember that your opponent gets to play Magic too. So whether you're adding interactive elements or ways to intercept what they're doing, whether it's by playing creatures or enchantments or whatever, you have to have something to do in the early game. And these are the numbers that have worked throughout the years the most consistently. But again, I'm not going to hold you to that. You can play 12 2 drops and 12 3 drops if you want to, although usually you want your curve to descend from two. But again, not every deck is the same. Not every deck has the same philosophy. And whether your ramp, control, mid-range, aggro, combo, or whatever will affect these numbers. I'm just kind of telling you what the average is. But here we are at number five. And this is no card advantage or late game engine. I kind of wanted to put both of these into the same entry because they are somewhat similar. And because I just wanted more entries. Honestly, so <laughs> there's kind of seven entries on this list because of this. But, you know, in terms of card advantage, I think a lot of people know to put removal in their deck, put creatures in their deck, have enough threats in their deck to where they can actually effectively win a game, have recursive threats, have cards that do more than one thing. A lot of people understand a lot of that while not really understanding that they need real card advantage in a lot of their decks. Even aggro decks have some form of card advantage a lot of the time. But some of the best examples of this right now our deck like Rogues, for instance. One of the most backbreaking things that can happen to you in the Rogues matchup is you think that you're dwindling their resources down. You know, you've gotten a couple of counter spells out of, your, out of their hand. You've had to sacrifice a couple of your own spells to do that, but you've been able to control their board state for the most part. Everything's fine. You might be able to pull this off. And then they cast into the story and draw fresh four cards. That can just be demoralizing because card advantage is really that important. A lot of control decks in the last season, you'd have them on the ropes and then they'd cast Chemister's Insight into Chemister's Insight and suddenly they've refilled their hand entirely. This kind of card advantage is incredibly important because a lot of games of Magic, whether you're playing aggro, control, whatever, are going to come down to top deck wars if you don't specifically plan for this. Cards like the Great Hinge are another really, really good example of not only card advantage, but a late game engine as well. So now's a good time to jump into a late game engine. <laughs> Again, the Great Hinge is probably the most perfect example in Standard right now because it's in a lot of decks like Mono Green Food, for instance, probably the best example, that can do cool stuff like play Wicked Wolf and Lovestruck Beast in the early turns, Scavenging Ooze sometimes in the early turns, but it's also got these late game engines of the Great Hinge, um, Gilded Goose creating food tokens, which you can then break to get card advantage off of Trail of Crumbs, right? You know, the Mono Green Food deck is probably the best deck right now. If not that, then it's Gruul um, of, of sort of bridging the gap between the early, middle, and late games, right? It's got good answers in the early game. It's got good creatures to kind of take control of the board state in the mid game. And in the late game, if it hasn't won yet, it draws all the cards in the world off of Hinge and Trail of Crumbs. A late game engine is very important. And Mono Green Food isn't the only one that does it. You could argue that the Yorion decks have a late game engine called Yorion. You could argue that the Ramp decks have a late game engine called Ugin. Uwugan. Or Genesis Ultimatum is kind of a late game engine. Plus Terror of the Peaks. The Genesis Ultimatum Terror of the Peaks combo. 
Kind of, again, a late game engine or a late game combo to just finish things if you're having trouble actually getting through for combat damage. That kind of goes into what I was saying about adding dimension to your deck a little bit earlier. But it really also goes to show that what you need is late game options, late game card advantage, and late game answers. Cards like the Great Hinge, End of the Story, and Genesis Ultimatum are all ways of generating advantage in the very late game to make sure that you don't run dry. And number six, probably the most esoteric of all of these, but probably one of the ones that needs to be said the most, is just not building to the meta. Because whether you like it or not, again, your opponent gets to play Magic, and especially on Arena, and even at like FNM and stuff, you're going to have to play against the best decks in the format. There's just really no getting around it. Even if you're homebrew all the way or whatever, when you play actual Magic against people, you're going to have to play against decks that are popular in the meta. So you have to build your decks in such a way. And this is where a lot of people say, I like to build rogue brews. I like to build home brews. I hate net decking, blah, blah, blah. And you can hate that all you want. I'm, I'm fine. That's your right. Um, there's a lot of intricacies, I think, in that conversation. And maybe it's another conversation. We'll have it a later date. Um, I think there's a lot of positive things about net decking or whatever you want to call it. But again, conversation for another day. Whether you're into it or not, you still have to know what the meta is because you're going to be playing against these decks and you can build the best magic deck in the world out of context in a vacuum. But once you actually try to play it in standard or modern or legacy or popper or whatever, historic, you're going to come up against a whole lot of specific cards that you should have known to game plan for that might be really good against whatever your game plan is. There are a few good examples of this right now. For instance, the mono green food decks I was just talking about will often incorporate a two of Thrashing Brontodon or Gem Razor nowadays, but it's still very often Thrashing Brontodon into their main deck. Why? That's because even in best of three at this point, it really pays to have a main deck answer to Embercleave, the Great Hinge, Doom Foretold, any number of artifacts and enchantments that people might be playing. And by the way, it has the added effect of when you come up against known quantities in the meta, like Yorion, you can take out their Doom Foretold. Gruul, you can take out their Great Hinge or whatever. But when you come up against Rogue Brews, like whatever people are trying to do with Enigmatic Incarnation, for instance, you also have a tool against the, the, the other home brews in the format. So, again, it's important, just like I said, to include interaction. This dovetails with that. But just to know what you're likely to come up against. Another good example is Scavenging News or Cling to Dust. These are two cards that are seeing a lot of play in best of three main decks right now. Scoos because it's just a good card regardless, but Scoos really cuts down on a lot of strategies. You know, it, it exiles Croxes out of the graveyard. It exiles creatures and Planeswalkers from the yard so they can't get them back with Elspeth Conqueror's death. It exiles stuff from the yard so they can't replay it with Lurus. It exiles Lurus from the yard so they can't get it back with Call of the Death Dweller. There are so many reasons <laughs> to play Scoos in the format right now. Ditto Cling to dust, which in control decks and rogues decks is a way of gaining life and drawing cards and having a way to utilize your own graveyard in the late game while also hosing other graveyard-based decks. If no one accounted for the meta, no one would play Cling to Dust in any main deck ever, but because the meta is the way it is, we have gone from a one-of main deck Cling to Dust in a lot of decks to as much as a three-of nowadays. And that's because knowing the meta is so important. One more example I want to use, by the way, is a really interesting one to me, and that's Fire Prophecy versus Scorching Dragonfire. All right, what deck uses which card? Combo decks or decks that are looking for a very specific card, like Winota decks, for instance, that want to incorporate removal, might play a copy of two or of Fire Prophecy because, again, they want to draw as many cards, see as many cards as possible to get to the most important pieces in their deck to enact a combo or just play Winota or whatever they're trying to do. But other decks, control-oriented decks that sit behind a wall of permission and removal for most of the game before resolving their key threat to finish things off. They will often want to play a card like Scorching Dragonfire because it does so many more things against so many more cards. Again, the combo deck or the Winota deck or whatever is just trying to get the specific cards it needs as quickly as possible so it doesn't care if it has to exile a creature. The control deck does not want to deal with Croxa ever again so it can Scorching Dragonfire the Croxa while that triggers on the stack and Croxa is exiled. Anax. It can exile the Anax with a Scorching Dragonfire without it splitting into tokens or anything like that. So there are all kinds of reasons why one deck might want Dragonfire and the other deck might want Fire Prophecy. And I think that's super awesome, but I also think it's important to know the difference between which deck wants which card. 
Whew, but I think I actually made it through and I said everything the way I wanted to say it. For now, I might do a part two of this. Um, in a couple of months, if you're interested in it, because there are a lot of things that didn't make it into this video that I'd nonetheless like to talk about at length. Because again, I think that's one of the things that a lot of articles and videos don't do. They don't talk about things at length. They assume you're a little baby, a little baby magic player, and you <laughs> you just don't know anything about building decks. I assume that you're, you know, sort of intermediate or you built a deck before or whatever. Maybe you're a beginner on Arena. But even if you are a beginner, I don't want to hold your hand and tell you like, hey, kid, don't put all them cards in your deck. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be that guy. So um, I also don't want to be the guy that's like, hey, here's a secret. Play good cards in your deck. I don't know. What? <laughs> I've actually seen that as a piece of advice. Uh, play good cards in your deck. It's Einstein. Genius. Again, if you enjoyed it, like, subscribe to the channel, do all that stuff. Subs really help me out. Hit the bell for the notification. I'm trying to get to 120,000 subs. Um, and the more subs I get, the more YouTube puts me in its algorithm because lately I've been waiting like four days between videos to put videos out. So my videos don't show up in the algorithm. They don't get recommended to as many people. So like, subscribe, it will get my status in the algorithm back up. I really like that. But if you want to support the channel, you can come over and watch me play magic on twitch.tv slash sbmtgdev. We play magic at least twice, if not three times a week on Twitch. And we have a lot of fun doing it too. What's up? Big ups to my Twitch crew, by the way. I love you all. But And I love, I love you. By the way, YouTube fam, you brought me here. You brought me to the dance. I still love you. And I think I'm making some of the best content in my career, if I'm being honest. But I, I'm glad to, to those of you that are still here watching the videos, make sure you share it around. I think it gets to a lot of people. But aside from that, if you really want to support the channel, check out the Patreon link in the description. A dollar a month lets you, you know, vote on what stuff we even do here on the channel and on the Twitch channel. Five bucks a month, signed card, and the votes. <laughs> Ten dollars a month, you get in the Deck Doctor program, and then we can play your decks on stream and stuff. So if you're interested, give it a shot. I need patrons. I'm poor. But aside from that, I guess I'm done. <laughs> Again, I really hope you enjoyed this one. And if you did, let me know so I can do more like this. But I'm out of here for now. Still got a ton of content planned for this month. So make sure you get in with the channel. But I'll catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.